Today is day one of Unit 4. We're moving on to Unit 4, Empires and Colonies. Today is day one, and our topic today is post-Napoleonic Europe and America. The first question for today is what happened to France after Napoleon left? If you recall, at the end of Napoleon's career, he was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. After his defeat, the other European nations exiled him to the island of St. Helena. And then they were left with the question of what to do with the French Empire. The French Empire took up a large amount of space in Europe. The borders of it exceeded historical France and stretched all the way from Russia to the North Sea to all of the Mediterranean. Once Napoleon was exiled, the leaders of Europe met in Vienna to decide what to do with France. The countries who had won at Waterloo decided to crack down on the French ability to have uh, to attack other nations and to prevent French aggression in the future. They were also intent on making sure that the lands that they redistributed to the other countries were redistributed fairly. The leaders of these nations succeeded in doing the thing that Napoleon never did, which is to negotiate with each other for a peaceful change of who's in charge of the land. Rather than fighting each other in endless wars, the leaders simply met in Vienna and in a series of meetings over maps of Europe decided how to redivide the former French Empire back into the different nations of Europe. Importantly, this individual over here is seen carving up the map with his sword rather than carving up his opponents with his sword. This is the first major time when European nations meet on this scale to establish a peaceful solution to borders and territorial problems. This leads us to the question of the balance of power. How did these European kings and their uh, deputies create a balance of power in Europe? Effectively, they took what was once Napoleon's empire and turned it into the new European borders that we are almost familiar with today. Much like the gentleman weighing the scales on the left-hand side here, the European nations wanted to make sure that there were powerful countries that could balance out the power of France. They could balance out against the power of France so that French aggression would no longer be as much of a problem. One of the most noteworthy things they created was the German Confederation. In the middle of Europe, the German Confederation was carved out of a uh, of combination of lots of tiny little German states that were assembled together into a loose confederation that could function as one political entity that could stand up to the strength of the Kingdom of France. This balance of power was not super stable, but it was the most stable balance of power that Europe had seen in a very long time. By the time we get to the end of the Congress of Vienna, we have five major powers in Europe, Britain, France, Austria, Russia, and the brand new German Confederation led by its largest state, Prussia. Sometimes students ask, why not the Ottomans, the Italians, or the Spanish? And the answer is that those countries were weaker for a variety of reasons that we don't have time to go into at this exact moment. But suffice it to say that these five major powers, Russia, Austria, Germany, France, and Britain, would balance out each other's strength so that no one of those five would be able to bully, attack, um, or unfairly uh, disadvantage any of the others. Now jumping across the Atlantic, how did the French Revolution and Napoleon cause the end of the Spanish Empire in America? And here on this slide, we're gonna look at Mexico specifically. The answer to this question has four parts. 
And we start by looking at this chart of the racial and social status of people in Spanish Mexico. When Mexico was part of the Spanish empire, the peninsulares, the people born in Spain, had the highest status. The next highest status were people known as Creoles of European descent, but born in America. Below them were the mestizo, mulatto, Native American, and people of African descent, who made up the majority of the population and the majority of those who were impoverished. Those who were poor and in poverty were mostly mestizo, mulatto, Native American, or of African descent. Inspired by the French Revolution and its ideas and promises of equality, two gentlemen, Miguel Hidalgo in 1811 and Jose Morelos in 1815, were inspired to start a revolution in Mexico. Miguel Hidalgo uh, led uh, Amerindians to demand rights and equality, much like the peasants of the French Revolution. Jose Morelos had a plan to give equal rights to all races of all people in Mexico. His plan was to redistribute land from the rich to the poor and to create equality for everyone along the lines of the French Revolution. The Mestizo, Mulatto, Amerindian, African descended people revolution led by these two gentlemen, Hidalgo and Morelos, who were themselves Creole, um, built up some steam to re rebel, rebel for freedom. And even though Hidalgo and Morelos were both killed in the process, the movement continued. Meanwhile, uh, across the Atlantic, Napoleon had invaded Spain. The invasion of Spain uh, took the King of Spain off of his throne and weakened the Spanish ability to crack down on protests in America. While the government of Spain was weakened by Napoleon's invasion, the people in Mexico were able to rebel. Once Napoleon put a French king on the throne of Spain, even some peninsulares wanted to join in the rebellion because they did not feel that they owed loyalty to a French usurper to the throne. This brings us to our last question for today. <coughs> How was France involved in the fight for Mexican independence? Part of the answer we already know, because by invading Spain and deposing and taking out the King of Spain and replacing him with a Frenchman, Napoleon gave Spanish colonies in America the incentive and the freedom to rebel against their Spanish royal leaders. Also though, after many years of civil war within Mexico and war that continued against Spain, uh, Mexico won independence from Spain under the leadership of Don Agustin Iturbide. He obtained the empire of Mexico, as it was called, through a partnership borrowing money from France. The French were happy to loan money to a insurgent movement in Mexico because it hurt their enemy, Spain. However, um, as Iturbide came to power, uh, he tried to tax and confiscate lands from the wealthy, maybe confiscate and sell church property in the tradition of the French Revolution. But this was kind of too little too late and unable to eventually pay the loans the Mexican empire defaulted on their obligations, defaulted and did not pay their debts to France. This led Napoleon III, not Napoleon Bonaparte, but Napoleon III, who by this point is Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew, to send from France this gentleman, Maximilian. Maximilian was put in power as emperor of Mexico by the government of France. France took over Mexico because Mexico did not pay back their debts to France. Maximilian remained emperor of Mexico for a while. Um, the Mexicans continued to fight back against French control, against the control of a monarch, and eventually, famously, at the Battle of Puebla in the 5th of May, 1862, 
the French were defeated in a symbolic, if not militarily important victory. This led eventually to the execution of Maximilian and in 1867, freedom for Mexico. <coughs> also during all of this time, there was a war between Mexico and the United States. This portion of the Mexican empire broke off to become part of the United States. This portion broke off to be other countries. The United States was fighting a civil war. Many, many other things were happening. This is not intended to be a complete story of the Mexican wars for independence. But just to give you a sense of how the Mexican wars and independence movements and struggles fit in the chronology of the events in the rest of the world. This lesson has only four summaries. Submit these four summaries and start your homework reading. <laughs>